fishermen whose vessels were small enough so that they only went away for a short time and therefore weren't isolated from social life ashore. Yes. Let's say I, I, I didn't want to go and study whalers who spent all their time in the South Atlantic and really uh, didn't yeah. have an impact on local society. And um, um, I consulted a friend of mine, a Norwegian friend of mine, who was working in Oslo at the time as to the right sort of place to go. He advised me to go to Bremnes. So it so happened that in his office there was uh, uh, a woman who had been born in Bremnes and who was still in contact with people there. And she arranged for a relative of hers um, to look after me. I went to live in his house. But you're, um, although you're interested in boats as movable property, mm -hmm. in fact your uh, first uh, published work was on land and immovable, immovable property. That's right. When I got there I found that it was a completely non-starter. All the vessels, all the fishing boats uh, that had been in use uh, at the beginning of the war had either been sunk by the British or requisitioned by the Germans. So it was a non-problem. There was no inheritance at all, no possibility of inheritance. There were no boats? Well, they'd got new boats. Yes, I see. And none of them had been inherited yet, and none of them likely to be inherited. In fact, a lot of them were sunk in order to qualify for a subsidy. Yes. So you moved into, you moved away from the sea inland. No, I studied fishing, right? Yes. But it did so happen that um, I had this information on um, land rights. Um, one of the entrenched clauses in the in Norwegian constitution is concerned with the transmission of rights in land, so-called Udelsrett, and um, this seemed a fairly obvious place to start. And the work on fishing, that you're, uh, you, you also got a lot of material on that as well. Well, I've got quite a bit, yes. Uh -huh. um, not as much as I would like, um, but I did, I mean, I have, uh, in my article on Carson Yes. And committees, I do talk about fishing and the yes. contrast, and I discussed this with Redfield, the contrast between the ethics of fishing and the ethics of agriculture. Yes. Remember that I said that fishing is a kind of warfare. Yes. It's hunting. Yes. And you were in Bremnes for over a year? Well, in the first instance, uh, we were there for, oh, more than a year. We had two winters. So I had two winters there. Yes. For about sort of uh, 15, 18 months, 15 months, I suppose, 16 months. Yes. And you were there well, with a the family? Back. Well, my family came later on, yes. They joined me after I'd been there for about six months. Yes. And they went to school there? No. Um, our eldest child was less than seven, which was the ah, age at which they started yes. school in those yes. days. Yes. So they didn't go to school. Um, yes. And then you went back to um, uh, University College when you finished in Bremner, did you? No, I, I was, no, my job at University College had come to an end when yes. I, uh, I'd become an honorary research assistant instead at yes. University College. Um, no, I went back to, Nor to Manchester to write up my material and uh, started to apply for jobs. And I applied for a lectureship in the University of Cambridge, but uh, I was unsuccessful. Oh, well, who oh, got yes. that instead? Edmund. So I then got his readership in London. I see. Oh, yes, yes. And that was in 1954. Uh, that was, uh, I went to LSE in January 1954. That's right. Yes. I see. So that was, of course, that was Edmund's uh, That was Edmund's uh, job. Readership yeah. that you got yeah. there, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you were at, uh, you stayed at University College for what, uh, two years? Well, I, at, at LSE, you mean? Yeah, at LSE. I'm well, uh, two years and a term, I think it was. Yes. Um, that's right, two years and a term, because I left uh, at the end of the Lent term 56. Yes. To go to Australia. And that was, you were working with Firth and Shapira again at that time? That's right, yes. Uh, Shapira just, I think Shapira came. Perhaps a little after I did. I'm not quite sure, but uh, he we came about, uh, that about, time. About, about that time. Yes, because yes. I remember talking to Raymond about uh, Shapira coming, but, but we were walking along KP at the time, and I'm not quite sure when it was. And you had uh, and mostly when you were when you were at 
LSE, you were teaching and... Uh, I was teaching, yes. Heavily. Yes, yes. Yes, I, yes, I was really pretty busy. Yes. So you didn't get much time to do any writing or anything at that period? Well, not as much as I would have liked, no, no. Pity, really, but uh, uh, I, was, I was really pretty busy. Yes. You know. And your next job was in Australia? That's right. And uh, you took over the chair which uh, Firth had earlier held and Rankler Brown of Sydney? Well, Firth uh, was never really the professor, he was only an acting head of the department. Uh, he was only acting professor. Ah. Rankler Brown was the first holder of the chair. Yes. And then there was this interim period when Firth was sort of acting. But Elkin was the oh, I next see, Firth was never... Uh, I didn't realise that. I thought that Firth that took over the chair, yes. No, yeah. um, not really. Mm. Um, I think he, w he was only acting head of the department. Yes. And then he went off to LSE to uh, yes. lectureship. Yes. What prompted you to uh, leave a, uh, a nice berth that you had in... Uh, well, there were a number of reasons, I suppose. Um, it seemed to me that um, um, most of my colleagues in England uh, who were senior to me were healthy and not all that old, and that it would be a long time before any senior posts became vacant in England. Yes. Um, I had four children by this time, so I was anxious to um, earn enough to look after them. I found working at LSE uh, not all that congenial, I suppose, in as much as uh, I could never uh, really um, empathize uh, with Firth. Um, and I think the precipitating cause was that uh, Firth had uh, uh, submitted a manuscript uh, to the LSE monograph series, yes. which I thought was so terribly badly written that it was unfair to his uh, co-author to publish it. And so uh, I took rather a rather stern line about that. So I thought it would be better if I left. <laughs> and, uh, and Sydney was the only prospect that you saw of leaving for at that time, was it? Well, that was the only chair available, yeah. yes. It didn't seem to me there was, a, there was, there was un unlikely to be any chairs in Britain for yes. a considerable time. I mean, were you trying to get back to the Pacific? Uh, no, I don't think so, no. No, I don't think that was uh, a reason. But you did start some work, I suppose, inevitably, out there, because you got involved in New Guinea. Well, I got involved through my students in New yes. Guinea, and also I got involved with Aboriginal Australia, again, through my students. Yes. But I um, didn't, in fact, ever uh, do any field work, and I didn't. I never collected any systematic data in in any anywhere when I was in Australia. Had I stayed on and not come to Cambridge, then I would have, in fact, gone to New Guinea. I, I had a plan li lined up to study a place. Um, well, in the it would be in the West Sepik, uh, north of Telefomen, that sort of area. Oh yes. Um, what were you going to look at there? Oh, well, I wanted to uh, look at a, a society which um, had, I, I mean, I, I forget the details now, but I, I think I was really concerned with uh, sort of patterns of authority and things like that in a yes. society that uh, lacked um, organized chieftainship but on the other hand also um, didn't have this pattern of uh, organized um, competitive big men leadership uh, that we find in the Highlands. Yes. And I had visited a number of areas uh, on the Highland fringe on the northern side and it seemed to be a very pleasant sort of area to work in. And your work on the uh, Moongin uh, that you published yes. later on, yes. I mean that really arose out of your reading of uh, your reading well I, that's right and I, I had in fact visited the Mungin, but yes. uh, or at least uh, one of the bits where the Mungin might be mm -hmm. um, because I'd, I'd supervised uh, Les Hyatt's work yes. in, in Arnhem Land so yes. I had actually been there yes. but it, it was essentially an intellectual problem well, find it very different teaching uh, I mean you just come from the LSE which was the um, epicenter of anthropology in the 1930s, if mm -hmm. not in the early 1950s. 
uh, and apart from getting away from Sir Raymond and earning more money to keep your numerous family, um, were there any other benefits or costs? Well, there were certainly costs, yes. I remember uh, feeling very dejected at the low expectations of academic attainment that I found. At the undergraduate level or the graduate level? Well, I think uh, at the uh, level of the staff as well. Really? I remember writing to Gluckman saying that uh, I'd got this job in Sydney and uh, nobody was going to take the slightest interest in anything I did and I could sit here for the next 25 years and uh, not write a single paper and no one there would complain. You felt that? Yep. And I remember That's saying that I, I was thinking of applying for some deputy assistant doorkeeper's job in SOAS, which is uh, the worst I could think of. Well, uh, yes, at that time. Of at that time, raised, of course. It's raised its level <laughs> since then, but uh, really, yes. um, I mean, that's uh, so I thought it was a harsh good words, really, yes. considering that, uh, I, mean, I mean, Radcliffe Brown must have had some joy there. I mean, he did a certain amount of, I mean, he encouraged a certain amount of research to go on. Oh, that's right, yes. He, well, he... Uh, he had um, quite a lot of money uh, to encourage research with, whereas uh, I had nothing. I arrived in Australia at a time when, uh, well, when no, the university, penniless, when the universities were at their lowest ebb. Mm -hmm. uh, universities then uh, were funded solely by states, not by the Commonwealth. And it was only while I was there in Sydney that uh, the Murray Commission recommended that uh, the Commonwealth Government should interest itself in the um, financing of universities and as a result of that the Australian um, University Grants Committee, Commission, whatever it was, uh, was set up and things started to improve. Why? I had smaller staff than, than Elkin had had before me, in fact. I mean, why did it decrease? Why did uh, Radcliffe Brown have more money than you did? Radcliffe Brown was, uh, got a lot of money from Rockefeller, I and mean, all his uh, all the research which he um, um, promoted uh, was financed from American sources, not from Australian sources. And then, unfortunately, the treasurer of the fund uh, embezzled it all. And uh, as you know, a lot of uh, Australian researchers suddenly found themselves penniless, like Penniman and Stanner and so on. The the, the well, uh, the, the, treasurer the, tre treasurer, the treasurer of the fund in Sydney, who was a of professor the Rockefeller of, fund? No, of uh, the treasurer of the body which was administering the money in Australia. Was that the Australian National Research Council? Well, something? it was a subcommittee of that, I think, yes. 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 Of which uh, Radcliffe Brown was the secretary and then Firth was. No, 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 no. Ah. No, uh, Radcliffe Brown, I think, was never a member of the ah. uh, National Research Council at all, in fact, and there was some ill feeling about that. Um, but um, certainly um, uh, the, the funds were misappropriated. But Radcliffe Brown had, in a sense, attracted the funds to Sydney. That's, that's a story, yes. I've never gone into that, but, but certainly that, that's the official version of what happened. Yeah. Well, yep. I was... Yep. Uh, yep. I mean, in a sense, in the same way that uh, Malinowski attracted the same funds to Yes, yes, uh, yes. LSE yes. and the International African Institute. But then what happened to Elkin? How did he get the money? He had, there was still uh, Rockefeller money going on. Yes, I mean, after all... Uh, this Radcliffe was Laura Spellman, uh, Laura Spellman... Uh, I think so, probably, uh, yes. And yes, yes. Run by that extraordinary man, Rummel. Well, who uh, offered the money to Cambridge for a chair of sociology. Uh, who didn't give, yes, I was coming back to that. Yes. <laughs> That's uh, right, yes. Well, he offered the money for political science and sure. sociology. Yep. And got, got a, the one uh, in the Boomer, yeah. Boomer, Martin Boomer, write, uh, Martin Boomer writes about it. That's right. Yes. Well, I think that uh, it's well, that probable, the I'm not yes. absolutely clear, yeah. that the Sydney mm -hmm. money also came, came from Ross Spellman, and it also came from Rummel, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who had been a pupil who had been trained in Chicago in the days of um, Albion Small. And, oh, I see, uh, yes, yes, yes. And who transformed this foundation. Mm -hmm. And it funded, they were very interested in empirical research. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that was probably why. Oh, I see, yes, yes, yeah. yes. But then they went on, but what about, it, it must have continued under Elkin. When did Elkin well, take over? It, uh, well, Elkin uh, took over. Uh, Radcliffe Brown left in 1931, yes. and Elkin must have taken over in about 1933, I think. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I think most of them were on five-year grants or something like that. So that uh, but you got nothing. I mean, when you came, there was no money at all. Well, there was no, no, there was virtually no money for research They'd at all. They put it into Canberra. Ah, well, Canberra was uh, the Australian National University, but well, that was funded by the Commonwealth Government. Whereas New South Wales, the government of New South Wales was responsible for funding yes, Sydney. Yes, some of the research at uh, uh, some of the research at Sydney was funded by Commonwealth. No, Wales. not then. I think not. Oh. Well, there was nothing available to me anyway. All we had was, I think, one studentship, which were, had been founded by a man called Strong, who had been a medical officer in, in uh, Papua. But that was all. So there, w there wasn't uh, much of a f scope for. For a research program. So, who did you have there as students? Les Hyatt? Les Hyatt was, um, uh, and uh, Michael Allen and Frank Jones. Michael Allen had uh, migrated from Ireland to come to Sydney. Well, via Nepal and uh, Western Australia, yes. Yes. What about Megit? Uh, Megit uh, was already in the field in New Guinea when I first arrived, and then he was appointed to a lectureship. <coughs> that was my first appointment. Uh, yeah. that I made. Um, but um, uh, he was already uh, in, in New Guinea by that time. But I mean with uh, Megit, Hyatt, Allen, you had a lively intellectual circle. Well, they were just grad... Um, um, uh, Hyatt was just finishing his undergraduate uh, work and then went on to, to Canberra where they could offer him a research studentship, which I couldn't yeah. have done in Sydney. Yes. Um, and Michael Allen was doing an qualifying exam for an MA, oh. and I persuaded him to abandon his candidature for the MA in Sydney and also go to Canberra, where there was more money, and where I was going anyway by that time. Oh, you were going by then. Mm. When did you get... Um... Well, I was in Sydney for two, two years and a little bit, about a week or so. But you mean halfway through that period you were appointed to... Um, to a chair in, in National yes, University. Yes, yes, yes. And took over from Nardell. Well, there was an um, um, interregnum of over two years, I suppose. There was, a? Mm hmm While they were searching? Yes, because um, Edmund, for instance, arrived in Sydney, um, oh, uh, three or four months after I'd arrived, on his way to Canberra. Uh, and they were trying to persuade him to take the chair in Sydney, in, that in Australia, been, in, um, uh, in Canberra. That would have been? In 1956, that would have been. 1956, when yes. he had been a lecturer in Cambridge for two years. Yep, yep. And was feeling the strain. Well, I think uh, he was uh, also um, offered uh, the, uh, sort of a field trip in Sri Lanka on the way. Oh, yes. So that uh, um, no doubt he was, you know, he was interested. Offered by? By the ANU. Was it? Oh, yes. You mean they paid for his work in Sri Lanka? Apparently. Or enabled him to go there anyway. I mean, he could stop off on the way to Australia. I don't, I see. I don't know the details, the, uh, but I remember him yes, mentioning yes. this uh, uh, as being one of the um, attractions of visiting Australia, quite apart from yes. looking over the possibility of um, accepting the chair. Yes. And then, um, so it was after a year or two that you were appointed? Uh, well, yes, yeah, so after 18 months or so, I suppose. I, for, for about uh, six months, I suppose, or so, I, I ran Dell's, both departments. Nardell's post was a post in uh, anthropology and sociology. Well, the department was a, a department of anthropology and sociology, but as I say, his chair was in anthropology. The name of the chair. And your chair was in anthropology, too. That was an, uh, yes, that's right. But you were head of the Department of, of Sociology. Of Anthropology and Sociology, and Sociology yes. Yes. But it was a department in the School of Pacific Studies, so the sociology that we did had to be Pacific rather than Australian, as it were. There was a, there was a, a division of labour between the two... There were four research schools in the original plan of the Australian National University, Medic medicine, physics, 
social sciences and so-called Pacific studies. And these were designed to attract back the four eminent uh, Australians or New Zealanders uh, to the ANU. And Firth was to be the first director of the School of Pacific Studies and Hancock the first director of the School of Social Sciences. And uh, the division between the, these two schools of social sciences as they were was always a bit obscure. But um, the notion was that uh, the School of Pacific Studies would be more heavily engaged in field work and at least for the most part would be engaged in field work outside Australia. I see. So the Pacific um, uh, began where the social sciences left off. Well, that was its sort of internal boundary, and the external boundary was subject to negotiation. I had some difficulty in persuading my colleagues that uh, uh, a field study just north of the Hindu Kush, north of the Salang Pass in Afghanistan, was part of the Pacific, but I managed to do so in the end. What about the Australian Aborigines? Well, they were, again, considered part of the Pacific rather than oh, Australia. They were. So there was, again, there was yes, a yes. Uh, black-white uh, That's divide right, there. sure. Yep. So Pacific Studies was kind of browns and blacks. That's right, mainly, yep. And the director of that was... Uh, well, there was no director when I first Davidson. went there. Davidson was only dean. Uh, the first director was John Crawford. He was an economist. Mm -hmm. And um, there you were teaching only graduate students and you had money. That's right, yes. yes. So you were quids in. That's right, sure. And so that you had a lot of people coming there, going to the field. Yes. Uh, our, budget, our budget was made up of about 50% on salaries and 50% on research expenses. Working largely in New Guinea. Well, um, not only in New Guinea, um, but we did, uh, I suppose, uh, that was the the largest uh, concentration, but it was also a department which had archaeology and linguistics in it. Um, and in purely geographical terms, we ranged from uh, the northern part of Af Afghanistan to, uh, I suppose, Tahiti. Yes. But uh, it was mostly research, so your teaching was limited. Well, there was no lecturing. Uh, we, we had uh, research fellows and we had research students, but you there were no gave courses. There were no undergraduates. No. Well, the only courses we gave were on things like mapping and things like that. But, but you no. didn't give courses in um, uh, anthropology. No. It was assumed that people who coming to us would have already got uh, MAs or, or BAs at least, good BAs, in social anthropology before they began. So it was just seminars of people. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember a man arriving straight from Harvard saying that in the few months that he had before he went off into the field, he wanted to bone up on kinship, as he called it. Yes. I expressed some surprise at this. And he said, oh, yes, he'd never been to any lectures on kinship in Harvard because, uh, I don't know, he'd always been away or the courses had not been given and so on. But you didn't uh, give him any there. I didn't arrange a course of lectures just no. for this one chap, no. no. So that you were, um, I mean, that was a very um, privileged situation, really. Well, it was privileged for those, uh, uh, for the research students and the research fellows. It wasn't particularly privileged for me running this vast show. There were about seven, I, I once uh, made a tally of the number of people who, if they wanted to commit suicide, would probably come and crown my shoulder first. And there were over 70 people in this category. Yeah, luckily, they didn't all want to commit suicide at the same time. You mean they were, um... But some of them did. They were, um, research students. Well, they were members of staff and secretaries and so on, yes, the whole yes, shooting yes. match. But you were, um, uh, you stuck that for, um, 11, 11 year, years. 11 years, that's right. Yes. Um... And then left from the frying pan. Into the fire, that's right. Yes, what made you uh, come back to Cambridge? Well, you may remember that you sent me a copy of the advertisement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think probably this is strange when I need another glass of sherry, but <laughs> I, uh, yes, I do sort of uh, remember that, uh, yes, yes, I do, uh, yes. Well, uh, leaving aside these personal <laughs> On well, the contrary, how could we do them aside? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Um, but you, um, you were very committed to Australia by then, whatever your... Um, well, I was uh, committed to... I, I, I still am committed to Australia, there's no doubt about that. But um, I thought that I'd been there 11 years, uh, that if I didn't move then, I probably yes. would be stuck forever until yes. I retired. Yes. That uh, after 25 years, I would uh, not only find, uh, not only would I find um, Canberra rather boring, but also I would become rather boring to other people. And that uh, 11 years was quite long enough on, in the one job. Yes. Um, I suppose I'm uh, supposed to ask you <laughs> how you uh, how you found uh, Cambridge. Uh, that well, would take us to another. Uh, Another tape. Ten reels. That's it would, yes, yes. All I can say is that if I'd known what it was going to be like, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> well, I imagine that's the point I wish we were finished. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, you would have stayed. Or you well, I don't know that I would have stayed, but I don't think I would have, um, I would have uh, come here. I might, uh, there was some suggestion at one time that I should uh, switch to sociology in ANU. You mean in the college? In the institute. Yes, but that wouldn't have been any better because you would have still been in, a, in an administrative position. Well, that's I mean, right. Uh, you've been in administrative positions. Yes. Since you made the break to um, Australia in 1956. That's right, yes, yes. And you would have been going to another one, would you? I would have been, yes, Which yes. Which would have had the same disadvantages as the anthropology. <coughs> yes, <coughs> it would have well, but it uh, it would have been a fresh group and a fresh I set of problems and so yes, on, and yes. uh, you know different. It would have been in the other research school, and so on. And, um, yes. And there weren't uh, research chairs that you could have gone to, as distinct from administrative chairs. Well, I didn't know of any. No, I would have uh, looked rather keenly at any that I had seen. I mean, it seems a, um, a great pity that, um, unlike, say, departments of economics, mm -hmm. where you've got one person ministering in about five other chairs, or yes, like yes, 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 or physics or whatever, mm -hmm. that in the uh, other social sciences. Uh, the professor tends to be mm. in the department, so yes. there are a few research chairs. Yes, in that's to right. Go to. Yep. Were there none in Australia? No, not really, no. Um, we managed to get two chairs in my own department. Stanna had one yes. in the end, but that was, uh, at that time, um, I think the only one, well, perhaps there was one in philosophy, but um, otherwise uh, all departments had only one professor, and the professor was head of the department. And Stanner, of course, is working in the Institute of Aboriginal Studies a great deal. I well, he wasn't actually at that time. No, that that's a rather another, another another rather complicated story as to his relations with uh, Institute of Aboriginal Studies. Um, but um, I mean, he was, I think, understandably reluctant to assume uh, too much of uh, administrative responsibilities in a, when I was still there, as it were. But if you hadn't, I mean, you wanted to leave uh, Canberra after having done 11 years and not wanting yeah. to sort of... Uh, well, the other reason why I think I wanted, to, uh, why I was attracted mm -hmm. to Cambridge was that you had told me that in uh, Cambridge, unlike a provincial university, professors tended not to be head of departments and that it was all done for one by, all done by, you know, the secretary of the faculty board. So I uh, was attracted by this Well, proposal. that was true in economics, of course. Yes. Um, that was true in economics, where it was done in that way. Yes, yes, yes. And since at that time you were joining economics... Uh, That's right. I <laughs> maybe uh, extrapolated from that particular <laughs> model... Uh, I see, yes. Uh, well, the details of the extrapolation, unfortunately, weren't explained to me. <laughs> well. Maya must have been. I mean, I wasn't the only consultant that you. Uh, oh no, had on no, this, no, 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 no. I was brought up. To, I was brought up to to always to ask three informant. three informants, and if so they say the. You asked Maya too. Yes, I'm not so sure about Maya. Um, whether I asked him. Edmund. Edmund no, I don't think so. No. Um, 
No, there were there were other reasons. I mean, I my daughter was uh, over here in England, and uh, to some extent, I had applied for the job only in the hope that I would be interviewed, uh, so that yes. I could get my fare paid to see her. Yes. And then yes. I was trapped, of course, because I was offered the job. Yes. Um, so that I was. Uh, what happened was that um, I thought that she was becoming a hippie, and uh, that I was neglecting my parental responsibilities. Yes. But I ought to try and see her, therefore, and I accepted an invitation to contribute to a festschrift for Levi Strauss, oh, yes. which was to be uh, unlike other festschrifts. Time of the arrow. Well, that was my contribution, yes, yes. But um, it was to be her, uh, a seminar was to be held in New York at which uh, Levi Strauss would discuss with uh, the contributors uh, uh, what they had written about him or, or in honor of him. Yes. Operation Gift Horse, as I called it. Mm -hmm. um, and when that fell through, I was a bit stuck and wanted still to see my daughter. So and I so I had to apply for this job in the hope that they would interview me. Well, as you know, I also applied for the job. That's right. And had you turned it down, <laughs> there was not much chance that I would get it, but uh, <laughs> we might both have been in a different situation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you would have gone back to Canberra. Yes. And served out your time. Uh, well, or else I would have thought of something else. Yes. Some other ploy. Yes. But you really wanted something which wasn't on the administrative side. Well, that was I, what I was hoping for, yes, yes. And of course, that's what I got. But what I got was a job with entirely political responsibilities, not administrative ones. If I'd had administrative responsibilities, then I could have resigned from them in protest. But as it was, I was stuck with these political responsibilities, which I couldn't... Uh, sort of slough off in this way. So, um, you could have um, retired, as others have done, to Churchill. I could have done, but uh, that would as have been... As others have retired to all souls. 